The second silencer took about the same length of time to make as the first, although the copperhead already had everything ready for the detachable silencer. The copperhead's muzzle was already detachable. So I just unscrewed the old one, and made the silencer grooves the right length to screw right on. When I was done, I pulled it into a shooting stance. It was heavier than the old muzzle, but nothing excessive. It was getting late, but I didn't feel like sleeping, so I grabbed my gear and headed out of my room. Where you going? June called out from the couch as I walked in, and I shrugged. Shooting range. I made a silencer for my rifle, and I want to give it a test run. Huh? June replied as he stood up and walked over looking at the copperhead that I was carrying in one hand as I held a box of ammo in the other. He moved in to take my rifle and I just sighed as I lifted it up so he could take it and look it over. You made this? Just the silencer. I made one for my Lexington as well. Not your bow, yeah? PFFT. The electromagnets interfere with baffling tech. You can't put a silencer on any of them. I said with a shrug. Shame. This is cool. Want to make one for your amazing big brother? I crinkled my nose as I looked him over. Why do you even want a silencer? You don't fight sneaky. Maybe I want to start. He said with a smirk that told me that was a lie. You just want a silencer to show off how cool you are. I want a silencer to show off how prim I am. He agreed instantly without even attempting to deny it. Fine. Go get whatever you want one for. I'll start making it before I head to the range. June grinned at me as he ran into his own room and then to my surprise came out with a weapon I didn't know he even had. When did you get this? I asked, looking at the Malorian overture that was. Well it was in tiger claw colors. Ugly was my first thought, but I wasn't going to be mean to June. Fujimura Summer gave it to me a while back. I don't really use it though. So? Nope. I denied instantly. Laughing a bit as June's face fell. It's not that I don't want to make a silencer for you June, but look. I pointed out the overture's barrel. Can you see the problem? There isn't anything to attach the silencer to. Exactly. I would have to completely remake the barrel. Normally not a huge problem but this is a Malorian revolver. The entire upper receiver is a solid piece of metal, cause Malorian is extra like that. That means I would have to remake the whole thing. I'm not seeing the problem here. June offered and I waved a fist at him, making him back off. That's a lot of work, and while I'm pretty sure I could do it, give me some time and I'll see what I can do. Until then, keep your revolver. Fine. But you better remember I will. Jeez. Okay. In that case I said, making my way towards the door. But June interrupted me with a grin. Let's hang out at the range, Emoto. My shoulders slumped. I had been planning on doing some serious grinding. Fine. I couldn't say no to sibling time with June. Dash. We hadn't gone to the range I had been visiting. Instead June had demanded we go to the TC range he had once dragged me to so long ago. I had agreed, mostly because the ammo would be cheaper. But when we got there, got settled in, the worst had come to pass. That which I had feared. June was a range hog. He was happily plinking away with my copperhead. This silencer is prim Motico. It would be even more prim if I got a chance to shoot it. I muttered quietly. I had told June I was here to stress test the silencer, and that was a mistake because he now had a perfect argument to keep shooting every time I got bored and wanted to shoot. Just a few more emoto. Gotta see how your silencer handles it right? He replied happily and I just glared. He was acting like a kid at a candy store. Which, like I'm happy that June is able to look like a kid, but I really wanted to kick him in the shins for hogging my gun. Kusanagi, and the little Kusanagi. Good to see you back. Grizzled gun range guy greeted us walking up as he looked over June's shooting. June decided to join me. I offered grumbling at my gun hog of a brother. Copperhead? Interesting choice. They are reliable, not the best though. It works, that's all I really need. The silencer is new. I made it myself. June is helping me stress test it. Oh? Becoming a bit of a techie huh? Good skills to have. Especially if you know how to do gun work. I nodded. The grizzled old man's whole job seemed to be maintenance and work here at the range. Yeah. It's come in useful. 
I'm working on modding out some of my weapons. I did a silencer for my Lexington first. I offered, then since the man was staring interested in the silencer at the tip of the copperhead I pulled the Lexington silencer off my gun belt, and offered it to him. He accepted it without another word. Quickly finding the latch to open it up and check the electronics, and going over the little device. Not bad. He finally offered after a minute of looking through it. You made it out of a printer right? Yeah. I can tell from the construction. Those things aren't bad, quality can take a hit if you aren't careful though, he said giving me advice. Hey, not bad. June pulled out as he checked his score on the electronic targets. It could be better. The man cut in before June could properly enjoy his score. You've been jerking the trigger on every shot. It's pure luck your chrome is heavy enough you aren't missing every shot. Back to it, Kuznagi. There is no excuse for such shoddy marksmanship. I nodded along at the critique, until I realized it would mean June would keep shooting my gun. Try with a different gun. I would like to shoot my copperhead at some point today. I grumbled, and June chuckled at little as he put the rifle to the side and pulled out a unity from a holster on his back and then began taking slow ponderous shots. I wanted to groan as I realized June was going to take forever. Looking around the range I sighed. Every other lane was still taken, which means I would just have to wait. Bored? I was asked and I nodded a little before he chuckled. Come with me then. The old grizzled man offered and walked back into his little office. I considered it. June and I were hanging out. But June was also being a scop muncher right now so I followed, entering into the little office covered in guns and equipment to maintain said weapons. I blinked interested as he walked over to a Masamune that was up on a clamp. You ever see one of these? Arasaka Masamune, yeah. Never played with one though. Always thought they were a little over-engineered. Hey. Lot of kids have an opinion on one until they actually get their hands on them. Come over and tell me what's wrong with this one. I blinked at the sudden challenge and shrugged. The Masamune was Arasaka's pride and joy. An assault rifle that was engineered the shit out of. Incredibly light. Incredibly tough. Expensive as shit, and as I said it was the sort of weapon that was engineered to hell and back. I wasn't really a fan to be honest, but as I started running my hands over her. Gun nut filling in a ton of information about the weapon I was holding I had to admit. Araska did know how to make a good rifle. It was probably a good 10, or 20 grand more than I would pay for a rifle, but you paid it for a reason. Thankfully Gun Nut's specialty was knowing whether a gun I picked up would fire in the heat of the moment, so just touching the Masamune told me what the problem was. Someone had an accident. I muttered, as I pulled it from the clamp under watchful judging eyes. I pulled out the receiver, looking around I found a toolkit nearby and scooped it up, grabbed a screwdriver, unscrewed literally a dozen little screws. Fuck you to Arasaka engineer. And finally managed to pull open the upper to find the problem. Shrapnel had gotten into the firing assembly. I pulled a piece out and whistled. Someone was lucky. Piece of bullet shrapnel right into the firing assembly. You spotted it quick. They replaced the part of the upper receiver that was damaged and it wouldn't shoot. They couldn't figure out what happened so brought it to me. He agreed nodding as I then sighed, a few more moments to check the chamber to make sure nothing else was damaged. I started the long task of putting this thing back together. The best part of course was my reward. 100 technical ability XP gained. You needed me to look over your weapons last time you were here. Saratoga if I remember right. That sounds right. Do I even still have the Saratoga? I muttered to myself. Did I still have the Saratoga? I vaguely remember seeing it during the move. It was probably in my closet with most of the other weapons I had collected and didn't use very often. You know how to handle a weapon. You didn't need me to check them. Ah, I've learned a lot since then. I muttered. And June is always overprotective. Hmm. If you ever want some work, come by. I could use an assistant. I opened my mouth to ask if he could even afford me, but honestly grizzled gun range guy was cool for a TC guy. I don't know if I'll take you up on that, but I appreciate it. Then again it could be a good excuse to grind some XP. He just nodded in acceptance. It's on the table if you want it. Then without another word he pulled another rifle down off the racks around the room. An axe this time and started working on it. 
I thought about it. June or guns? I walked over and after checking it with Gun Nut, I worked with him on fixing the problem on the Ajax. Dash. I can't believe you left. June grumbled at me, as we walked out of the hidden TC range. You hogged the entire lane. I didn't even get to shoot. I snapped at him, and June did have a decency to look a little embarrassed but then pointed a finger at me. You already shoot better than I do, so I need more practice than you, he said, surprising me, as I felt my jaw drop open. You, complimenting me as an excuse for your bad behavior isn't gonna work, I retorted back, but damn him. I was feeling better after being complimented. June could tell as well as his smile went smug. Your silencer was stress tested and I got some practice with a rifle. Don't use them much so it was a nice experience. Yeah you're too much of an ogre to shoot straight. Better to stick with a shotgun or something. Only. I have class. June's retort earned him a very judgmental look from me, but we were outside and walking through multiple groups of TC gonks that were hanging around. So I did the nice thing and didn't call out my brother in front of his gang. Burrito boy has class? PFFT. Shut up. He grumbled at me. I didn't say anything. I sing-songed at him, almost breaking into giggles as he reached out like he was going to smack me, or grab me, but I just danced out of the way. You don't have to say anything to say something. Oh no. The ogre is after me. I faux gasped and that set it off. A moment later June burst into motion to try and grab me, but once again my ankles proved to be the best thing ever. Because I leapt up and over, a foot daintily smashing into my brother's stupid face and then bouncing off that. Ow. Fuck Motoko. June grumbled as I landed a dozen feet away. Laughing all the while as he rubbed at his face. Oh please. You have subdermal there, your face is more chrome than anything you baby. Of course June and I now had a crowd looking at us. June just turned to give the grunts a glare that very swiftly had everyone minding their own business. On the other hand I just didn't care. June had wasted my gun range time, and now I was feeling impish. Don't even think about it. He told me as I felt my grin spreading across my face. Think about what? I teased him, even as I reached over and handed my copperhead to a TC gong that I was now standing next to much to his surprise. Hold this for a second. What? I don't know for sure, but I know you well enough June started but was cut off. I charged at that moment as he was distracted, mid-sentence, bringing him up short as I leapt up, but only to trick June into thinking I was going up high, instead I flipped landing on my hands, rolling into a somersault that had me sliding right between his legs and then behind. Right as his socket chirped and ejected his bike's key shard. Yoink! I chirped out, snatching it out of the air, and avoiding Jean's retaliatory swipe. Motoko. He he he. I cackled as I leapt to make some distance, and now it was on. Give that back. Oh no the ogre is after me. I called out waving the shard and then it really was. I dodged past him, as he made to tackle me, grabbed my copperhead from the staring TC grunt and I was off. On foot June was probably a little faster than me, but I had hops. Every time he got close I would leap away, usually up high then leaping over something that he would have to traverse. Of course I wasn't just messing with my brother here. This was important training for my out-of-shape Hogaronii. I mean sure maybe making him almost smash into a wall by hacking a vending machine so I could crush a can of Nicola, making the concrete wet right as he was turning the corner was a bit mean. Funny as fuck though, I was still cackling as I finally ran into a dead end in an alleyway and realized I would have to go over June to escape. But as he rounded the corner, he just roared and leapt back at me. Uh oh. Instead of trying to escape I just leapt up onto a garbage can and then onto a fire escape climbing over just in time to avoid his grasping hands as he had tried to follow me. We stood there for a second. June had no way to get up high enough to get me up here. PFFT. I snickered and rolled over putting my hands onto my chin as I lay down on the fire escape and just looked at my brother. My brother, who was gasping for air. You need more exercise. I don't. Usually run for that long. He grunted up at me as he leaned against the wall. Like I said. Exercise. Gonna. Gonna chip in some synth lungs. He grunted instead and I scowled. Yeah cause that's what you need. 
More chrome. Gonk. But I rolled my eyes realizing that my fun time was over. I quickly rolled off the fire escape and landed easily on the ground. I pulled out the key shard and offered it to June who quickly snatched it up and put it back in its socket. You. You are going to work on my defenses so no one else can pick socket me. He grumbled at me with a pointed finger. I just rolled my eyes. As if a netrunner with any skill would have any trouble breaking through any defense he put up. Come on you lump. Let's get you home. I informed him as I started walking towards his back and my quadra. His grumbling had me smiling happily as he followed after. Dash. So this isn't just a trap right? I asked into our comm line as we were all waiting outside the Gold Beach Marina, funnily enough. It's not a trap. And if it is, that's what you are here for. Hiromi responded with a hint of amusement in her tone. Malcolm had done exactly what he said he was going to do. He had found someone selling a Cali burn, and he was going to buy it. So now all of Section 9 was here to make sure it wasn't going to end up with a bullet hole in our tomb. Hiromi and Malcolm were out hanging around the front of the marina waiting, while Ichi and I were in his truck. The truck that was facing away from the marina, its back door unlocked but held almost completely closed so I could see out. There may or may not be an HMG sitting in the back of the truck just in case of any nonsense as well. I patted my barely used girl as we all waited. That's him. Hiromi added suddenly and I looked back out. Down the ramp into the marina parking garage came a Rayfield Caliburn. Its engine rumbling as it went past Itchy and I, down into a parking spot near the entrance of the marina. Look at that beauty. Malcolm muttered on the line, and I rolled my eyes, probably Itchy and Hiromi doing the same right alongside me. If I had to hear even a single more Cali Burn fact from Malcolm today I was going to stuff his mouth with a double XL burrito and throw him in a trunk. The call went quiet from Hiromi and Malcolm. I watched them approach the man that stepped out. No guards? That guy was brave. Then again he was right next to the marina and if he was a member the security would try to protect him. A moment later all three of them went into the marina to one of the bars near the entrance and started talking. I could see thanks to my Kiroshi, but they were too far to hear, and I had zero skill in lip reading. The inability to hear reminded me and I pulled open one of my back pouches, pulling the max docks off the top until I came to the bottom. There was my directional microphone. I hadn't had a chance to use it until now. I quickly put it on, and pointed my finger in the right direction. It took a bit of wiggling around with the controls to get the right conversation but then I succeeded and was listening in. It was boring. Malcolm and the seller were literally gushing about the Cali burn. I instantly felt my brain shutting off. So I was mostly just zone out, sitting cross-legged in the back of the truck waiting for something to happen. And waiting. And waiting. Eventually, finally Hiromi and Malcolm stood up. Malcolm shook the man's hand and they both stepped out of the marina. Malcolm quickly broke into a run as he charged at the Cali burn, and it opened at his approach. Hiromi took a few seconds to say something but they had moved enough my mic wasn't catching it. Whatever his response was, it satisfied her and she started walking up towards the truck. I guess that means the deal was a success? Itchy asked, seeing that everything was over I stepped out of the back of the truck to join them. Oh yeah. The guy was more than happy to sell, and Malcolm happy to buy. Hiromi offered with a sigh. They spent like 20 minutes just nerding out about the car. Yeah I heard. If he liked his car so much, why sell it? I couldn't help but wonder. Especially since I remembered firsthand what happened when I bought my Kusanagi. This was his second one. And it was older I guess. He mentioned something about it being too old for him. Hiromi said and I rolled my eyes at that. The rich kid that they had bought from was one of those guys then. So everything should be good? It'll be fine. The Rayfield contract was transferred over. As far as Night City, Rayfield, and anyone important is concerned the car is Malcolm's now. Contract? Ichi asked, a moment before I did. The security contract? Hiromi offered and seeing both of our blank stares she sighed. Rayfield has a proprietary security system. Any intrusion will automatically call NCPD teams to the location to secure it. Part of the deal with buying one of the cars apparently. She said a bit too casually, which I caught. Apparently. Wait. 
You didn't know that either did you? I accused Hiromi as I caught her slip and she flushed a little. Malcolm may have gushed about it a bit. We broke apart not long after that. Ichi had something that he was being evasive about that he wanted to do, and Hiromi had to go back to school. Apparently her parents were fine with her missing some classes to complete a business deal, but not the whole day. I decided to head to the range. I had looked over the silencer on the copperhead and it seemed fine, so I was going to fire more rounds through it and see what happened. And of course try to level my reflex stat some more. I walked in with my copperhead, and a box of ammo. Settled into a lane, happy that it was quiet this early in the afternoon, and started shooting. It was fun. I was getting a salt XP pretty consistently, and a reflex notification between every few alerts as well. The whole process was punctuated by the silent retorts of my rifle. I was even doing things like practicing quick reloads by flinging the magazine out of the gun and slamming a new one home as I fired. It was little things like that, that even with quick reload, having a bit of practice for it helped me nail the maneuver. I was glad we had just gotten the big payday, because when I ran out of ammo, I just went and bought more. And then again. I had to stop and switch to the Lexington to let my copper head cool off after a while, but then I just did the same thing with my handgun. I wanted some level ups, and I was going to get them. My accuracy was good as well. The targets in this range gave a little point for how accurate you shot, and I was shooting quick and accurate, ramming rounds through the digital targets. The points were meaningless really. But it still only made the whole thing more fun. I had switched back to the copperhead after letting it cool, and it didn't take long before I got what I wanted. 100 assault XP gained. Assault skill level up. I hummed. As I let the knowledge flow in. Assault 7. I let the level flow into me, and realized I knew a slightly better way to hold and grip the rifle to keep it stabilized while moving and firing. Useful. I took a break not long after. I had pushed my copperhead a bit too much. Gun nut was telling me, I should really stop firing before I start causing heat damage. I gathered everything up and headed home. The apartment was empty when I got there. So I took some time to clean my guns and prep them for the next gig. Then I flopped on my bed. It felt good to level up. To improve myself. That crushing weight of the scav threat and just general night city fuckery, felt farther away since I had improved. I just had to keep improving. Moving the numbers slowly and steadily upward. And eventually threats would go away. Either because I simply surpassed their ability to harm. Or because I destroyed them. Ringing. I blinked at the call that popped up. Pan Am? I sat up as I realized who was calling, what was Pan Am calling me for? I quickly answered to find out. Hello? Hey. Motoko. It's Pan Am, from the All Decaldos. Do you have a minute? Pan Am asked, sounding almost professional in her courtesy. Yeah Pan Am, of course I do. How's it going? I haven't seen you since I talked to Saul about the heist. Yeah. It's a long story, but I'm not with the All Decaldos anymore. I'm working as a merc in the city. I know this is a bit sudden, but I'm on a gig that I need some hands to help with. I wouldn't normally reach out, but Scorpion wouldn't shut up about your ability, and well, I could use some of that sort of help. This gig is important, and I can't have it going to scop. Well, Pan Am, you definitely called up the right girl. I'd love to help out. What's the deets? I sat up practically buzzing. New gig. I'll send you what I can, but it's that sort of gig. I don't know everything, the fixer is being real. Secure about it all. Send what you can, but if you need help I'm in. We're tombs after all. The line was quiet for a minute and Pan Am let out a chuckle. Thanks Motoko. I appreciate that. Night City hasn't exactly been what I expected on my own. Hey. If you need something. Anything, call me in okay? I have lots of tombs all over the city. Even if it's just to hang out at a club so you can vent to someone, I'll be there. Pan Am barked out a laugh. I'll keep that in mind. Deets are sent out. All right give me a second. I looked over the text. Instantly my eyes narrowed. This was definitely a fixer's work. I recognized the style that Waco Co used in her information packets, but it wasn't quite the same. 
mostly because the entire thing was very blank on what the actual gig was. Although what was really interesting was what the gig actually did say. Holy shit. That's a hell of a drive. I'm a nomad. It's what we do best. You were solid with Scorpion. So I. I'm not saying no Pan Am, just surprised. There isn't much here, and I don't like that much, but I'm in. I confirmed as I stood up. I was already starting to run around my room. I needed a bag of stuff. Clothes and junk. I realized I was going to have to raid June's burrito stash as well just to be safe. And let June and my tombs know. I was actually getting kind of excited. I had never been to Seattle before. Dash. Half an hour later I was pulling into a storage unit that was on the east side of the city. Just a block or so from the Bear Desert. Sixth Street tags covered the buildings in the area, but no one seemed to be around. Instead as I pulled in, I saw Pan Am. Pan Am's ass anyways. Look, I could recognize the booty anywhere. The game made sure of that. She was halfway into the engine bay of a thought in Mackinac. The same truck which I think was her personal ride a few years from now was a modded out monster. Many of the same upgrades as my quadra covered it. I pulled over not far from her and stepped out. I was wearing my armor and gear. If Pan Am made fun of me for being a doe girl I would be a little annoyed, but I wasn't going to go light when the gig involved traveling to another city. One where I wouldn't have any backup to call up in case something went bad. Pan Am. One second. She called out as she continued to rummage around with the insides of her truck. That was fine, it gave me time to grab my gear. I had a bag for clothes and toiletries, and a bag for food and snacks, cause I didn't want to presume on Panam's supply. But I also had ammo and weapons. I went around to the trunk that opened and stared at my supply. My hand twitched towards the Uragan, but that was a bit much, and Panam probably had one of her own. Instead I grabbed mine Ekamata and loaded a few of the spare magazines I had picked up for her into my armor's webbing. Hefting all my gear I headed over. This wasn't going to be a two-vehicle trip. I was riding with Pan Am. Honestly it was for the best. I had never done a long-distance trip like this before. Better to just rely on Pan Am's skill as a nomad. And done. She called out as she pulled herself free grabbing a rag and wiping her hands as she turned to look me over. I saw the raised eyebrow which I promptly ignored. Let me pack my stuff then. I offered as I headed to the passenger door and she nodded slowly looking amused. Should be room in the back seat, try not to squish my stuff. I'll be careful. I called out as I climbed into the seat and checked the single back seat that still remained. Half of her back seat was cut off from all the extra equipment in her truck. Including I'm assuming the machine gun that I remember could activate on top. The seat had a few bags of her own already there and I carefully placed all my stuff, keeping only my Nekamata in the seat with me. You sure you need all that? You hired me as a shooter, not dead weight. I called back and pulled out from the back seat to see her looking me over from the driver door. Leaning against it casually, with an amused look on her face. I'm treating this gig just as seriously as I am the one Scorpion brought me on, and remember, that time I brought an HMG. I'm surprised you didn't this time as well. Last time I took it on a Nomad gig, didn't go well, so I'm sticking to more accurate shooting this time. I said, patting my Nakamata. Well it's a relief to see you taking this seriously. She said, but her voice was more teasing than anything. Not sure what you got yourself into Pan Am, but between the signs of a good fixer sending you this gig, and how quiet you've been about it. I'm readying up for a war. Oh. I forgot the grenades. I'm such a gonk, I said laughing as I bonked my head and hurried over to my quadra. A few grenades were fitted into my chest rig carefully placed so their triggers couldn't go off. Didn't want to walk around with a fucking bomb strapped to my chest. That was only cool if I could get out of the armor fast enough. I jogged back over and this time Pan Am was in the driver's seat and her amusement was gone. You know I can't tell you anything about what I'm transporting? Yep, I said as I climbed in. All right. I'm not too worried about the trip itself, maybe some minor raffin trouble, but my girl can take care of that. She said patting her truck, but in Seattle the drop might be difficult. That's the point I'm really worried about. Well I'll keep an eye out regardless, and my girl can handle whatever Seattle throws at us.
I sat patting my neck Amata mimicking Panam's only motions. All right. Let's go then, she said, sounding nervous. Hearing that I of course put on my seatbelt. Road trip. Dash. You need anything? Panam asked hours into our drive but I looked over to her without really taking my eyes off the road, and camera monitors I had access to in the passenger seat. No, I'm fine. Fully hydrated. I assured her. Just like last time I had worked with a nomad, I wasn't letting any sense of boredom hinder me. It might be a few day drive from Night City up to Seattle, made longer mostly from poor roads, and being forced to take long detours to avoid wrath and territory, but I was fully embracing my cool, to keep an eye on things. Right. Right. Sorry, do you want me to chatter about stuff? This is the first time I've gone this far from Night City. It's kinda preem, and I could fill the air about all the cool stuff I'm seeing. Uck please no. Nomads know every driving game, or have heard everything you could ever see described in every way by bored children. I just didn't expect you to be this focused. You've been staring at the horizon and the camera screens for hours. I'm on a job. I might be a total gonk most of the time, but being professional on a gig is the best way to make sure everyone gets to go home afterwards. I told her as I do finally take my eyes away from the horizon. Don't worry. No matter what happens, I'll make sure we both get home. My world's meant to be reassuring made her look a little sour for a moment, she caught that I noticed her expression as it smoothed out. It's not you. I appreciate it, Motoko. I just don't really have a home at the moment, she said, her voice seeping with frustration. You want to talk about what happened to make you leave? No. No I really don't. I appreciate it, but just. It's fine Panam. I won't push. I'm glad you called me up though. This is nice, getting out of the city I mean. Hey, we'll make a nomad out of you yet. She offered and I stuck my tongue out, that wasn't going to happen. As I had once told Scorpion. I needed a big couch and an AC unit at the end of the day. Dash. You sure? Yeah. I know this group. Not the first time I've traveled up this way. Just play it cool, they can be assholes, but they aren't raffin. Panam said as she turned into the ancient gas station on the side of a broken down road we had been following. It was surrounded by a fleet of nomad vehicles, and we had been waved down by a group up on the roof of the pump roof, a little sniper's nest up there made out of old lawn chairs. The truck's rumbling engine died out and she stepped out. Well well look who it is. If it isn't the troublemaker herself. Scott. You're still alive? I thought for sure someone would have put a bullet in you by now. She called out as she put her hands on her sides and cocked her hip out. Hey. Nothing out here in the desert can catch me girl. Who you got there with you? He asked, looking to me as I stepped out. I was being nice and not carrying my nekamata, but I was still suited up just with my tech gogs up on the top of my head as I stretched my legs and walked around the front of the truck, scoping out everything around me as I met up with Panam. This is Motoko, she's a solo I hired. But the older Kaldos owe her something fierce. She pulls Scorpion out of a Rafan camp after they ambushed them. A long whistle escaped the old cowboy's lips. He titled his big old 12-gallon hat up to look me over, his one eye, obviously chrome scanning me. Well, if she helped the little brat out from those fucks, she's at least welcome as long as she doesn't cause trouble. But I'm sorry to say brat, the path ahead is closed down, has been for a while now. Best turn back. What? Come on old Scott. I need to get to Seattle. What could be closing down the Nomad Road? That's obvious, or you wouldn't be all the way up here, but there isn't a negotiation here. The Jodes have closed the road entirely. He slapped a knife hand into his other palm. Why? What's going on here Scott? He scowled. What else? His question seemed to finally hammer home for Panam as she scowled back, looking pretty fierce as she responded. Rafan. Something set them off fierce. They've been hitting anything going through the area, and I mean anything. You should have seen Anando. That big truck of his? They tore it apart. He barely got out. Fuck. That thing was more armored than even my girl. But Scott, we gotta get to Seattle, it's for a gig from a fixer. She added at the end, emphasizing fixer heavily. Then you'll just be another one of the many that have tried brat. I mean it. They have all sorts of hardware set up, military. Wait for them to calm down, 
or find a way around. Only option. Then I'll find a way around. She snapped, sighing and rubbing her forehead. What can you tell me about any other routes? Not much brat. Raffan have been all over these hills the last year. Not sure what is up, but they're definitely not making it easy for us. The old man shrugged. I know, the Alder Caldos have had trouble recently too. Pan Am offered and didn't get the reaction she wanted. PFFT. You're practically city dwellers, you Alder Caldos. The old man said, but Pan Am flipped him off, and they both laughed, so I guess it was a common insult between them. Come grab a warm meal, stay the night. The old man demanded then. Pan Am scoffed, but accepted, and I was happy enough to accept as well. I wonder if they had barbecue? Dash. So why don't we just kill the raffin? I asked as Pan Am and I were loading up the next morning. We had done as ordered and stayed the night in the Jodes Nomad camp. There hadn't been barbecue, but they had some faux maple syrup with their faux bacon, and you know what? It was pretty damn good. Cause that would be suicide. Too many raffin? Too much equipment? Or are you just assuming it's a suicide run because they told you it was? I couldn't help but ask, but Pan Am threw me a look. Both of the first two options. Raffin often have military equipment they pull out of their ass but usually not all the time. If they are just using the shit out right? Probably caught backed. Don't think of the way being closed by the Raffin, think of it being closed by some mega corp that is supplying the Raffin to keep the pass closed for some reason. I couldn't argue that, nodding along as I slid into the passenger seat. So what's the plan? I'm going to head east, try to slide around the roadblock. Don't really want to head into Idaho territory to get to Seattle, but if I have to. She offered and I just nodded. I'll keep an eye out then. It's annoying the Raffin are this difficult to deal with. They aren't after your mysterious package are they? No. Highly, highly doubt it. If they were after us, they would have targeted us and not just hit everything. Something is going on the Raffin don't want anyone to see. Could be a megacorp testing some new weapon or something. Or they are just hitting every convoy through this area as an excuse for a megacorp to hide the convoy they were actually after. She waved out the window and a few nomads tipped hats, or waved back as we set off. You ever gone the long way around? I asked and this time I watched her frown. Once. A long time ago. Great. All right. Just make sure that turret of yours is working. I grumbled, but returned to my own stakeout, as we set off through the desert broken highways, turning off the long highway we had been taking and heading east. Neither of us talked much as we traveled. Where before Pan Am had been almost casual on the drive, now she was actively working. Checking a paper map of all things, looking all around, constantly on the lookout for landmarks and keeping us going. On the other hand, I was focused on the cameras on her truck, and my own eyes on the horizon. Dash. We were camped that night. Pan Am had a tent set up and a fire going, which Pan Am and I were grilling some food on. Okay mostly Pan Am, I still had like 30 double XL burritos if I got desperate, but I also wasn't a cook. So I was happy that Pan Am was willing to share her nomad road chili. We might run into some trouble tomorrow. She finally offered and I felt my eyebrows rise up at the sudden words. Yeah? Raffin? Maybe. The whispers I got updated from Ol Scott said that this territory is sometimes controlled by some Raffin groups. With the main road locked down, likely some smaller groups, or even another big group will move in to try and catch people doing exactly what we are doing. I nodded at that, as I spooned some beans and synth meat into my mouth. If that's what happens we kill them and move on. Maybe loot some stuff. I said with a shrug. I had my Nekamata, and Pan Am had her truck's turret. You are pretty blaze about combat. She said and I noticed her hesitation. I had always considered Pan Am quick to jump into a fight as well, but maybe not so much yet? She couldn't have been out of the old Ecaldos for long. Hell this might even be her first gig on her own. I hadn't asked since she didn't want to talk about her circumstance. Are you worried? I asked and got a scowl in return, but that wasn't a denial. Well you aren't alone, and you brought me in to act as a solo to back you up. If you're nervous then just have some faith that you aren't alone. I'm not worried. She finally denied, but it sounded weak. I just worry about how many fucking wrath and shift we might face tomorrow. You got an ergon or something right? I asked and she looked at me like I was crazy. 
Of course I don't. She denied harshly scoffing like the very idea was absurd. Shame. If I had known that I would have brought my ear again. I replied, looking at her like she was crazy. Who doesn't bring a rocket launcher to a Mad Max car battle? Who just travels with a rocket launcher? She snapped at me, and I had to really hold back on saying that I had gotten the idea from her. Pan Am rolled her eyes and finished digging into her meal. I realized that she didn't want to talk anymore so I went and checked my nekamata. She could use a little cleaning from the dust, and I wanted to make sure I could use her for tomorrow if I needed.